All right, so let's remember back to all of our good old fashioned derivative tables here. So these are all ones we've looked at before. You know, if we wanted to differentiate the function sine x, derivative is cosine x. If we wanted to differentiate the function cosine x, derivative of that is negative sine x. Derivative of tan, secant squared. So we have all of these nice derivative tables that we've looked at. And we don't want to completely forget about these because there's actually information here regarding integration. So for instance, if we were to look at this first row right here, telling us that the derivative of sine is cosine. Well, we can almost think of this column not as just the function, we could think of this as our antiderivative column. So, you know, normally the way we read this table is we're reading it as the derivative of sine x is equal to cosine x. That's generally how we read our derivative tables. And what we're thinking of in that case is we're really thinking of it like this taking our, our, our sine function, doing the derivative, getting our cosine function. But we can also read this table kind of backwards. So we could start with our cosine function and read backwards. And really this is telling us an integral. This is telling us what the antiderivative of cosine is. So if we read backwards here, what this is saying is that the integral of cosine x dx is equal to sine x. And then actually, normally we put our plus c on. Um, but it's telling us kind of the, the main part of our antiderivative is sine of x. And so we could play this game for every single one of these entries. So for instance, if, if we were going to say, let's do it for this one right here with natural log of absolute value x, let's play that same game. If we think of it in terms of derivatives, well, really what this is saying is that the derivative of natural log absolute value x is equal to 1 over x. But if we read that backwards, if we read this backwards, another way to think of what this derivative table is saying is it's telling us the integral of 1 over x, the antiderivative of 1 over x, is the natural log absolute val um, natural log of absolute value x, and then we put our usual plus c on. So you know we have all of these nice tables to kind of refer back to, and they give us some information about the antiderivative. Now they're not entirely in the best format. So normally we're not interested in finding the antiderivative of negative sine x. It would be better if we could find the antiderivative of sine x. Same thing for, say, um, if we wanted the antiderivative of b raised to the x. Uh, we don't normally want the antiderivative of b raised to the x times natural log b. So some of these aren't in the best format. There's a little bit extra stuff that we generally want to kind of move around a little bit. And so we will form integral tables, but the integral tables don't just come from nowhere. They actually come from our derivative tables. And so just two examples here of where these might come from. So let's actually look at our elementary form integrals. And these are all ones we're just going to want to memorize. Um, we already have a few ones we just looked at. So the integral of cosine x dx is sine x plus c. That's the one we just mentioned right here. Also, the integral of 1 over x is natural log absolute value x. That's what we're seeing right here. Um, now, the integral of sine x is negative cosine x. Integral of e to the x is e to the x plus c. So all of these plus c is just kind of understood. So, you know, if I don't say it, just remember plus c at the end of these integrals. And so we have the integral of secant squared is tan. Integral of secant x times tan x is secant x. Integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is inverse tan x. 
Um, integral of cosecant squared x is negative cotan x. Integral of cosecant x times cotan x is negative cosecant x. And then the integral of 1 over square root 1 minus x squared is inverse sine function. And so um, there are just a few kind of technical points when we look at these elementary forms. Um, the first one is domain. Actually, I'm going to put this over here. So generally, when we're trying to find antiderivatives, we want our antiderivative to have the same domain, or maybe a little bit bigger, as the function we're starting with. So we want our antiderivative, capital F of x, to have the same or maybe larger domain. So that's why um, if we're looking at 1 over x, if we go back to our derivative tables, you might have been wondering, well, here's a 1 over x. Why isn't the antiderivative just natural log x? Um, and that's true in some respect. But generally, when we look at this function 1 over x, what is the domain of that function? The domain um, is all non-zero numbers, so everything except 0. Well, if it was just natural log x without the absolute value, that would be throwing out all the negatives. We wouldn't be able to do the negatives. So with this natural log absolute value x, this actually, the domain of this antiderivative is actually all non-zero numbers as well. And so generally when, we, when, we tr when we're given a function and we want to find its antiderivative, we want the domain of our antiderivative here to be at least as large as the domain of our original function. We don't want to kind of shrink it in some way. So that's why we're using, you know, more or less why we're using absolute natural log of absolute value x here instead of just natural log x. So that's the first kind of note here, kind of a technical point. But just something to keep in mind, especially for, for like this natural log uh, rule here, is that we want the dis domains to be the same. Um, another technical point is when we integrate, and it happens with this 1 over x one again, um, the way we write this is exactly how we've written it here. The integral of 1 over x dx is natural log absolute value x plus c. Now, the issue is that the domain is, we have to throw out zero. So this is undefined at zero. So this is another technical point that shows up for some functions. And so when we write the integral of 1 over x dx is equal to the natural log of absolute value x plus c, what this really means is that the integral of 1 over x dx is actually a piecewise function. So it's equal to the natural log of absolute value x plus some constant c1 if x is greater than 0. And then it's equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus possibly some other constant c2 on the other side when x is less than 0. So when we have a function and there's points, there's x values where that function's undefined, on each of the different intervals then for our domain, there could be different constants. So we don't generally write it out this way. So we don't generally write this as you know, distinct pieces as a piecewise function like this. The shorthand way which we generally use is just that plus c constant. But sometimes it's necessary 
if we have a function where it has a point where it's undefined, so this is undefined at x equals 0, well then we have a piecewise function then where x equals 0 kind of splits up the different pieces, and then on each of those different pieces we could potentially have a different constant. All right, so kind of a technical point, but it does happen from time to time. So constant C could be different on either side of x equals 0 in this case. And that's why we're seeing C1 and C2. Those could be potentially different. Um, all right. Yeah, that's pretty good for these forms. Maybe one other one just to mention here. We have our, our antiderivative of e to the x, um, but sometimes we're interested in integrating kind of a, a more general exponential function, integral of b raised to the x. How does that look? Well, it's b raised to the x. It's, it's going to involve the exponential function, but then we divide by natural log b, and this is plus c at the end. So why we, in calculus, we generally deal with these natural exponential functions, e raised to the x. And why do we do it in calculus? Well, because the derivative and antiderivative are so nice. Antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x. If it was some other number, if it was b raised to the x, well, it's still pretty nice, but there's a little bit more going on here. All right, we're going to try a few more examples, and then that'll do it. So we'll see at those examples in a, in a few minutes.